Okay, guys, welcome to the Last Set Podcast. Now, today I am correcting a mistake that I made last month. Joining me now for the official second time in a row, we've got Julian Justiniano. How you doing, brother? Thanks for having me again, mate. Really appreciate it. Well, I'm super excited that you're here because the first time that you came on, uh, which was a great episode, by the way, uh, it's just a shame it never made the internet, because never made the uh, audio <laughs> version, because what actually happened was I ended up uh, having two SD cards and then all of a sudden one SD card was completely full and then I go and we changed one halfway through I thought oh no that's okay maybe it's just filled up or no audio is lost and I go back I think I went back to work and then I went back to uh, on Monday ready to edit it and I was quite excited because we had a really fucking good time and then I realized I've only got half of the audio so when it recorded the first half I was like I've got 20 minutes of conversation with no context. I'm just like, oh, oh no. God. <laughs> because you can't do the same thing twice. But you're back now, and it's even better because one of the topics we discussed on the first episode was that you've been looking for a fight for quite some time. And that's been one of the hardest things for you to get an opponent. So now you've finally got an opponent. You're fighting uh, Owen Morecambe? Owen Tincombe, I believe. Yeah, Tin- uh, Owen Tincombe. Sorry so if I got that last name wrong. I've just read it. I've never actually heard it out loud. But... Uh, of course, of course. So tell me, man, how you feeling? So excited. Um, yeah, the last few weeks um, since I last saw you, training's gone fantastic. Um, my mindset's been a lot better, I would say, too, because I knew that I was obviously confident I was going to get on the card. But um, even if something didn't come through, training was just been going really well. And it's been more about, like, just having fun and actually enjoying training more than wondering if a fight's going to happen and when it's going to happen. So it was more like just a pleasant surprise when we got the news. And... It's eternal. They've been great to me. It's a fantastic show, so I'm I'm super stoked, man. Yeah. How's your um now officially now? What's uh? Do you know anything about the guy who we're fighting and all that? Is there any information you can give us? I know he trains at Scrappy. Okay. Um, I know he's fought on he's um fought a couple of times. He's two and zero, I believe. He's fought on another card called Domination. This is his first time fighting in Eternal. Um, decent striker. He's very good on the feet. It's um it's going to be a fantastic fight. He's got a couple of submission wins as well, so he's a well rounded guy. It's going to be fun. Cool, cool. So tell me, man, this is going to be your second time now fighting for Eternal, is that correct? This is the second time, yep. Cool. So, anyway, so let's, re- back, let's recount the first fight for you. Uh, obviously, which you won by split decision. I got to admit, the argument that I actually had, I honestly believe that you definitely won that and it could have been unanimous. Mainly because of the or dominance display of your you had diff, of your skill set. Obviously, most of the fight was stand up, but you did actually attempt to take it to the ground a lot, and you did show a uh, sufficient amount of ground and pound. Since then, when we came from the last podcast and all that, we talked about your wrestling background. So let's just a little rewrap a little bit of that for the uh, for the audience. Like, when did you start first start grappling? Yeah, so just going off memory now, um, straight out of high school, last couple of years, I kind of got into wrestling at a local youth center here, would have been about 13 or so at the time. But, um, you gone? Yeah, um, basically just fell in love with it the moment that I did it, had a fantastic time. Um, just started competing, going through the state competitions here and um, decided that um, the Americans are pretty good at it <laughs> because um, obviously college wrestling is a big deal over there. So I decided to spend a little bit of time abroad. I spent a few years training there, studying there. And, um, yeah, managed to get a few years wrestling in college as well. So that was a fantastic experience, and that's really helped me a lot. Finally got that just thing that just fixed right there. So no more fucking about. (laughs) Yeah, jeez. Okay, so let's rewind that as well a little bit. Because we talked about that and uh, the difference of what, uh, how, you know, Australian universities are to American universities. So tell us a little bit about that. Look, um, America's um, college system, Amer- you can argue America does a lot of things wrong, and I'll agree with you, I lived there, but man, their university system's something special. They do a really good job, especially if you're an athlete, because they'll find a way to incorporate that into your school really well, and you don't have to be an Olympian or an, an all-star kind of athlete. You can just be somebody that enjoys your sport, has the discipline to keep showing up to training and doing your job, and they will find a way to incorporate you in the team and give you a little bit of funding. And that's what really happened to me. So my story was I basically emailed around this state. Um, state was Iowa because they're the most well-known one for wrestling. And I basically asked a bunch of coaches, hey, 
if I paid for my fees for like a semester and I just rocked up and I just showed up and just got beat up by you guys, would you put up with me and would you allow me to be on the team? A couple of them got back to me and said, sure, come on down. So I took a semester off uni. I was on at UWA at the time and um, took that off, started working, you know, as a painter with the old man, saved up some money, went over there, got the absolute crap kicked out of me on my French. It was just brutal, but I kept rocking up. I was just enjoying the process. And then um, after a semester, so about three, four months, I came home and the coach texted me saying, hey, look, we loved having you on the team. Would you like a scholarship? And my first thing I texted back was like, why? Like, <laughs> you asked why? Yeah, like I said, thank you. Hell yeah, of course. Why? But like, because I wasn't winning. Like I was doing okay, but I wasn't like a, an elite level guy. I definitely wasn't on the starting lineup. I was getting crap kicked out of me, but he said, you're pushing the guys, you're showing up, you're a good example, and we're going to reward that. And that's not something that I really see here too much because the funding tends to get reserved for the elite kind of like mm. future Olympian programs, future com games and all that. Over there, there's a lot more funding available. You may not get a full ride, but you'll get something. And mm. it's enough to kind of incentivize you to keep going. Yeah. So I honestly wish that Australian universities could learn from American universities. Obviously, because Australia in Perth specifically, you know, there's not... There's, there's a bunch of, uni we have a f select few universities, but in America, there is like four. So many. Yeah, four per state and all yep. that. And then you got tiers to the universities. That's the thing. Like, my, I, did, I did not go to a four-year division one, like, school like Arizona State, the ones you see on, like, movies and stuff. I went to a junior college. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if you've seen the show Community. Like, that's kind of um, one that I went to, which was, like, really affordable. I still got the college experience but it was much more affordable. There were more scholarships available because they had more money to give because they weren't, the competition wasn't as big. So they definitely, because they have more schools, you have more options. That's not really a thing here too much, I don't think. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not even that, but you also have like scouts as well. That's a massive thing because whenever you hear about in a high school in America, like some kids who are like footballers or wrestlers, they've already got like universities dealt sorted for them before they even finish university and have people coming after them and looking. I wish that uh, Australia, uh, Australia had something like that. Obviously, it's got a long way to go, but if America can actually come over more often, look for better talent because what I'm always telling right now is like Australia is, especially in MMA scene and also in its grappling scene, we're coming out we're hard, coming guns we're blazing. Com we are coming up, man. Like, it's fantastic. Because what's it since the last podcast, our very own Jack Della has got his uh, next fight booked. Uh, I can't remember who he's fighting, but I remember, believe he's fighting on the next UFC card. He's going to Singapore and I'm going to be there. i got a ticket. Really? Yeah, I'm flying over. I can't miss that, dude. i got to go watch that. It's going to oh, be great. Awesome. The borders are down. We can finally travel again. The moment I saw that he was on the card and plus, like, who's headlining that? I think it was Jiri and Glover. <laughs> one of that card man it's gonna be great yeah. first UFC event to watch and i'm glad i'll be able to support him too yeah i mean at, is, was, was this be your first time going to a UFC event yep awesome so that's the other thing i noticed like you lived in america and all that but you didn't get any chance to go see any ufc events i, I mean i came close man i had so many opportunities especially around the midwest like a lot of fight night cards were there i think i was talking about watching habib was one of them but it was like 400 bucks a ticket you got to get in early Wow, yeah. four, what, 400 US dollars a ticket? It was sold out, so it was just scalpers. Yeah, because like, 400 US dollars, that's far more than 500 Australian dollars, yeah. obviously, because of the currency. Well, it wasn't the official one. It was just scalpers because it is sold out. And then oh. they, Yeah, and if you don't get in early for those, you're not getting a ticket. Like, yeah. So the moment the pre-sale came up for Singapore, I'm like, even if I don't go, at least I have it, and I can just pass it on after that. So. True, true. So... This weekend as well, one thing I wanted to cover with you before we get back into all the other stuff, because I wanted to go back through all the new information that we've been talking about. We've got a massive fight card, UFC, uh, sorry, massive UFC fight card coming up. Oh, The main event. Love to talk to you about this. Yeah, yeah. so Charles Oliveira uh -huh. got stripped of the uh, title because he didn't make weight. Now, obviously, as a fighter yourself, you know about weight cutting. You know, you've been through the horrors of weight cutting. We talked about weight cutting. I've had even a nutritionist, uh, Peter Miller, come on, who's also a nutritionist. Condition nutrition, Miller. yeah. Yeah, yeah condition nutrition, shout out to him, yeah. He's talked about the dangers of weight cutting, and if it's not done properly, it can be lethal. Obviously, we know that. So what's your take on the whole Charles Oliveira situation, and do you think it's fair that he's been stripped? Yes and no. Just from the rules, yeah, because it's the 155-pound championship and he didn't make it. 
But from what I've heard, and this is just Twitter gossip, so again, mm -hmm. like from what I heard, there there is always a test scale, bef um, outside that you go on before you officially go to weigh in. So Why do they have that though? Just to make sure that you can go in there and before you, because I think you have two weigh in attempts, and that's yeah. it. Mm. You get one if you miss it, you get an hour to go and cut, and then you get another chance. Again, if I'm wrong, quote me, but I'm 99% sure I'm correct. They have a test scale outside that you can go and check your own weight in, and I'm pretty sure that a lot of fighters were telling were saying that scale was measuring light i think by 0.7 or half a pound or something mm. so charles actually did weigh in on that made weight and tweeted he put a post on twitter that he made the weight oh and then he goes on the scale and goes holy shit i'm a pound i'm a pound over so why couldn't he lose it in the hour i guess he was already too dehydrated he yeah just can't get blood out of stone at the end of the day I mean, mm. it's disappointing. If that is true, because if he did weigh in on that one and that scale was wrong, the, not the official one, the test one, if that was wrong and he based everything off that, he might have an appeal possibly like, hey, look, you guys did me dirty. If he doesn't, yeah, like it must be horrible. I could not be in his position now to know that he's just fighting with nothing to gain and everything to lose. Because even if he wins now, he doesn't get the title. Exactly. <laughs> so... I can't actually remember the last time when someone who didn't make weight was a champion and got the belt stripped to them. I can't Not remember. Not the top of my head. I know Figueredo missed weight a couple times in the flyweights. Yeah. I can't remember what his punishment was. Yeah. He, yeah. Was, he wasn't – he was fighting for the title the first time, didn't make weight – and then he won the fight, but he didn't get he didn't get That's it. He was yeah. the challenge. That's yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. It was Benavides. Yeah. yeah. So he was the challenger. Um, he didn't make weight, so he couldn't win the title, but they still did the fight anyway, and he just kicked the crap out of him. Mm -hmm. But he didn't win the title because he didn't make weight. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's – weight cutting's a tough one. Hey, I know – I hang around people that know a lot more about it than me, and I just listen to what they say. My only number one thing is, like, if you are going to do it, make sure you got a professional helping you out. Do Correct. Do not go at yourself. And if you're – and I think I told you this last time as well. If you're competing in a JITS comp on a weekend just with the boys, don't cut weight. It's <laughs> like, it's not worth – it's yeah. not worth it, man. You're going to still have a good time and get some good roles in walking around. I know that you telling me how about you are bumping up and feeling much healthier, much better. Yeah. Like, it's – it's you're gonna have a much better time if you just feel good about yourself and you feel healthy and nutritious and you go out there and do yeah. the best you can. See, here's the thing though, but you look at Charles Oliveira and Justin Gagey, they are very similar in build. Mm. So, I'll qu sometimes I question the effectiveness of weight cutting, and maybe there should be some changes to it. I feel like maybe there should be a little bit more of a, a, a weight range. Mm. So it doesn't have to be under this weight, over this weight. I can say between this weight and this weight. Do you mean more weight classes? No, I mean oh. like the weight class itself the, is has a weight range of acceptable. So more of an allowance. Yeah. Ah, it doesn't have to be like dead on the actual thing. Exactly, or under. You know, it can be a little bit over. Mm. Because I question in – because obviously we're talking in American here, I'm talking pounds. How much is like half – like 0.2 of a pound? Like a point? 400 grams. Yeah, how it's much like is that more of an – is that really much of an advantage? It's nothing. It's literally nothing. It won't make a world of difference in that mm -hmm. fight. Like, even a couple of kilos. Like, if you're saying that someone beat you up because they weigh two kilos more than you, is anyone really going to take that seriously? Like, 100%. That's, yeah, that's, that's the main thing. So what's your predictions then on the fight? I've got my money on Justin now. All your money's on Justin? Yeah, I've, I've just – I that that'll do some damage, man. Mentally, you got to be a really mentally strong person to be able to bounce back from that and say, "I've still got to fight this guy," mm -hmm. and I have, like I said, nothing to gain, everything to everything to lose. I love Charles too. Like he's such an amazing grappler, such a great fighter. His story is incredible when you think about it. He, from rags to riches, rags to riches, grown up in favela. Even when he was in the UFC, he was always like just in that middle range, and then he he just held on and kept coming. Gaethje's obviously an absolute monster too. I've um, been looking forward to it for a long time. It's just real shame that this kind of went down, huh? Yeah, it affects – it does – I feel like it affects the mindset of how the fight's going to go because my money was actually on Oliveira from the before. start. Yep. From the Me start. Too. Me too. Because he's been in the UFC for a long time, you know. OG. And he's at – I reckon out of all the UFC – and he's got the most finishes. He's a featherweight too. Yeah. He was a weight class down. Which – yeah, <laughs> which is – yeah, correct. And we or, there's always an argument whenever the which the best division is. Some people say lightweight, some people say featherweight. I would argue it would be uh, featherweight of it, but you know because now there's been a few changes to the mix as well. 
I would, uh, my uh, my argument tends to turn a little bit towards lightweight mm. because now we got the amount of killers. Like if you take someone like Dan Hooker, for example, even though he's had a few losses lately, yeah. but if you actually look at who his losses are, I'm like, that's not really anything bad at all. That's know? what I, when people throw the term BMF around, what this is what me and my friends, when we talk about BMF, I think about the people that you fought. Like, yeah. how game are you? Like, that's it. Whether you win or lose, like, if you're willing to, like, Dan Hooker's a BMF. Like, when you think about the people he's fought, mm. Rafael de Sanchez is another good example. People that don't pick fights and just say, like, I'll fight whoever. Correct. Like, Hooker, like, three hands with Dustin Poirier, Barboza, all these guys, absolute monsters. Like, he's got my respect, man. He's a killer. Yeah. Correct. He hasn't been cut yet or anything like that. So. I don't think so. No. no. Yeah, but he's got, like, an exp- a question mark next to his name. Does I think Tony does as well? Yeah, that's the next thing. Know, what are your thoughts on know. the whole uh, Chandler? I hope Tony. that it's a safe fight and that Tony <laughs> does. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a safe fight. I hope it's a safe fight for Tony. I think that like he doesn't need to be hurt any more than he is. I think the last Justin fight did something to him. I don't know if you've seen that. I did. Oh. I watched that and I watched that because it was during lockdown. I was remember that day like it was yesterday. I was in my garage working out and had my laptop next to me and I'd do a set, watch some fights, do a set, and then I watched the entire Justin um, Tony fight. And then when he threw that uppercut and hit Justin, I was like, yes. That was good, yeah. It was good. I thought it was yeah. out. It was it, game over. And then on the fly, Justin just ad- adjusted his style to him. Yeah. And he was actually, I felt like he was pulling his punches a little bit just so he could get the points. Yeah. And then Tony just, you know, just, what is it, uh, he just deteriorated, and then he did. He, he the just, last fight he had against Bernal Darouche, I knew that Darouche was a world-class grappler and all that, but so is Tony, mm. and uh, his submissions, you know, they're, they're out of this world, but it was kind of sad t- towards the final round watching him just, like, be, again, be b- beaten down yeah. like that, and it's the same with Oliveira. He's, I don't think you can... <sighs> Since Justin, I don't think anyone can get and really knock him out and all that, but I reckon they can just dominate him because I reckon they understand his system now, you know. Uh, I do believe that this fight will go to decision. I can't see this fight being a knockout or a submission. I do think it'll be close. I do think... about Chandler versus... Yeah, okay. Chan- I yeah. feel like it might be... It will probably get bloody towards the end. Yeah. Because, you know, Tony likes to go on his shield. It's not about his willpower, hey. Yeah. Like, it's just, he just stays on his feet. Like, I mean, even that, like, when he finished the Justin fight, it was almost like, because he was shaking his head. Yeah. It's almost like his body was caving in and he's, he was just going, nah, nah, we got to keep going. <laughs> and then Herb's like, nah, bro, we got to stop this. I'm sorry. Yeah. Man. it's a, it's a, It was a wise decision. I is agree that with that. Good, is that, it's, it's admirable. It's like, we love it. Yeah. But how healthy is that for him? Because at the end of the day, he's going to be in his 50s and 60s, you know, when he's retired. And who knows what he's going to be dealing with yeah. because of that kind of mentality. They love it now, but I don't know. you got to consider your safety. Do you, is that you something know, you ever think about? 100%. The yeah. moment that I feel like there's any sort of like issues upstairs, because brain damage is a difficult one. Hey, you can't x-ray your brain and say that's hurt. Okay. You can even apparently, because I've um, asked around um, with some of the researchers at ECU, the only real like – 100% effective way to analyze like CTE is with an autopsy. Correct. There's only one problem with that. you got to be dead for that. I think what they do with the autopsy, they have to cut up your brain yeah, into yeah. little pieces. And it's actually a very, very expensive yeah. procedure. And sure. you're going to be dead when it happens. So it's not going to help you. <laughs> like, I mean, so you can only go off symptoms. And if you're feeling, because I know if you're feeling like you're having some issues, you know, with your head, you can't, I don't know, it's just too much to risk. So the moment I start to feel like that, I'm in it for a good time, not a long time. If I feel like I'm getting hurt, I'm out. Mm. I probably have a few years in me and then I've got a degree. I've got um, stuff going on. I don't need to fight for money. I do it because it's fun. Mm. So I think that's an important attitude to have if you want to stay healthy. Right? Yeah. I, well, the, 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 that's a valid point. It's, just, I learned, it's kind of sad sometimes because I meet, you meet these people and you would definitely refer to, uh, definitely know this better than I do, but you meet some guys, and it doesn't just revolve to fighting, but it revolves to can revolve to anything. But they do just one thing, and it's the only thing they want to do. It's the only thing they have interest in. And then once they lose it, that's it. You know, they, they're yeah. like, now what? And then that's yeah. when they go down that deep spiral. Mm. So I've seen it in wrestlers. You know, when they can't compete anymore, when they realize they can't compete, and they go to coaching. But for them, coaching is not as fun as actually being there and doing it. Wrestling is a tragic one because there's no, like, 
pro opportunity outside of college, especially for the Americans. And here, like, you're going to go to the Commonwealth Games or the Olympics if you're the best guy, and that's pretty much it. Otherwise, you're just doing sort of competitions around here. But once you're out of the college season um, time is when there's the season and you get to compete regularly and you have your teammates and you it's, it's awesome. I loved it. Loved every minute of it. But once you run out of eligibility because you only have four years to compete, the reason they have that system is so that LeBron James doesn't have like 20 years, you know, dunking on dudes in college. They yeah. need to make sure that they leave. But that only works when there's a pro league for these elite guys to go to. Mm -hmm. For guys like wrestlers who don't have a pro league, then – their careers, unfortunately, are over. And so there's no organizations or I've anything? I've tried, but wrestling just doesn't really have that kind of draw. Like I think flow grappling doesn't have anything? Or? They tried. They've done a few. Chael Sonnen's got a wrestling underground he hosts every now and again. They uh -huh. have um, the US Open Olympic team trials. It's a very government-funded sport, so they do okay with that. We struggle because amateur sports, unfortunately, we don't get looked after as well, but that's just reality, un unfortunately. Um but there's really not a pro league that can sustain a large number of athletes. If you're the best dude, sure, you're fine. But, um, yeah, that's why a lot of them end up going to MMA because there is actually money in there and there is a possibility to make a living. Was that like sort of what happened to you when you were in university? Like, oh, fuck, there's nothing after this, so finding it is. I, I was always going to go. Okay. Like, the main reason I started wrestling was I was keen on MMA from a young age. My story was I first started watching MMA around that, like, it was that Anderson Silva era, the black and yellow shorts Anderson. Yeah, like Ooh, that. But he was yeah. sponsored by Burger King. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and that. that was a different Silva. Like, people know him now in the Reebok one when he had the Bisping fights, and he was, he was okay. But when he was starting, mm, he was scary. And I watched him for the first time and thought, nah, like, I, I want to do this, but if I ever fought a guy like that, there's no way I'd win. Mm -hmm. And then he fought Chael Sonnen. Yeah. And that fight changed my life. Yeah. Because the greatest, the undefeated, undisputed, never lost a round. <laughs> no, like, Chael, the, when Chael fought him, I looked at that fight and I was like, I could do that. Okay. And that was when I started looking into wrestling. Uh, and that's so where, and I went from there. How old were you at the time? 12. 11, 12, 13, yeah. yeah. Around that time. Did you ever do any kind of martial arts before you did wrestling? I did Taekwondo and stuff, um, but that was just, I was a hyperactive kid, so my parents just wanted to shut me up, so they put me in martial arts. A lot of point fighting kind of stuff. So, like, not the most practical thing, but it's something. Yeah. Like, obviously, it teaches you how to move and stuff, which is nice. But point fighting kind of styles, they're better than nothing. I'll put it that way. But stuff like jiu-jitsu, boxing, Muay Thai, um, wrestling, which has a practical element where you can spar and get after it, they're mm -hmm. always going to be more effective. Yeah. I've always questioned now the, uh, what is it, the validity of, of point fighting systems because mm. of point fighting martial arts like taekwondo i've had it, i've spoken to uh a karate champion liv clifford she's told me all about it and the reason behind it is just that these kids they they do it and they want to be skilled obviously and they and they treat it like it's a hobby and a craft obviously they master it but they're not in it for pure intentions of violence mm. they're more in for intentions of just getting better at something it's and a skill it yeah. is a skill it's yeah Rather than, and then I've asked like, what do you reckon the validity of it is like crossing over into something like MMA? She says, well, it depends on two things. It's the style itself and who you got teaching it. So say for example, Wonderboy Thompson. Well, yeah, there's plenty of guys with karate bases. Correct. Stephen Thompson's a good example. Yeah, but like Stephen Thompson, he has to go to a more accomplished more renowned more known dojo it's not like something you can just do out of your of somebody's garage you know some people get black belts in karate or taekwondo after like four years and talked about it and then they de it degrades the uh what's the word the value of pretty much of a, what is a black belt mm. you know and they give out belts or give out stripes just yeah. for showing up oh, i agree yeah so that's the main that's one of the things i've always talked about a bit critical i mean my audience is pretty much like probably sick of me hearing it but when i see a black belt and then you always want to ask how many years have you been doing it and then if someone says to me oh, i did karate for four years and got a black belt i'm like my nephew's got a black belt and he's 12 like, yeah, there, <laughs> there you we've go heard, we've heard it before man. <laughs> so then you meet guys who do jujitsu for years mm -hmm. and years and years and like mm -hmm. in their 30s and they get their black belt and they are literally it's like their life is you're complete a bad man yeah if you're a jujitsu black belt like 99 percent of the time there's other like 
obviously there's schools and there's like fraudulent systems, but for the most part, that is a protected martial art where the belt, belt system still kind of holds up. Dang. A lot of them have been welted down, but like watered down. But you know, you roll as well. If you're a black belt in jits, like you're a bad man. That's yeah. like <laughs> well, it's a clear. It's it's also a clear distinction of um of your skill level. Mm. You know what I mean? Because if you if you in, I would say the biggest difference if it's like a white belt. Obviously, it's a beginner. There's a big difference between a white belt and a purple belt. Mm. Huge. Maybe even a better, a good blue belt. Yeah. So that's why I always respected BJJ because. For kids, you can't. I think the rules are you can't get a blue belt till you're 16. Is that correct? Yeah, I think it's that. Yeah, there's yeah. they have a belt system before that. I yeah. don't even know what it which is. I re- respect highly and that they do that. Yeah, yeah they yeah. do. So it kind of gives the um, you're right, it makes the um, upper belts more valid for adults and stuff. I think it goes, I wouldn't even be able to know what they are, but I know there's a green one and a gray one, it's green. different colors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Coming into the fight, man, let's talk about this. Like, what has the preparation been? What's the biggest thing you believe that you have to, or what's the biggest hurdle for you to get to this fight? Well, I can't even, I've gone over my last fight and it's hard to watch, which is probably a good thing because like you watch it the first time and you enjoy it and you have good memories about it. But then as you start to improve on the things that you felt like you had some issues with, you start looking back and say, man, that was different. I could have gone better here. And um, yeah, we've definitely made a lot of adjustments going into this. I'm not the same guy that I was in there. That's no, that's absolutely no doubt. Um, I'm much more well-rounded. I um, feel like I'm going to be taking a lot less damage in there. Like I'm much better with my defense and protecting myself. Um, my jiu-jitsu and my pressure is a little bit better too. A lot of, um, a big problem I noticed was like, it's actually without the rash guards on and stuff like that, it gets slippery in there. Really? really? Oh, yeah. It was hard. I <laughs> was the one thing I noticed. Like, a couple of the times when Lorenz scrambled out, I was like, damn, I couldn't hold on to that guy. Like, mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, man, we're all, we're all sweaty right now. So we've done a lot of, like, more simulation stuff to kind of – that was my very first time, like, in fighting in a cage, fighting like that. So mm. You did that really ex- well the first time, though. You were very, very composed. The one thing I always respect about that as well is for someone's first fight, you were actually really aggressive right off the bat, straight for him. Well, I've competed a long time yeah. and like I couldn't imagine going into MMA straight off the bat without mm. doing some sort of martial art or even sport before. Mm. Like um, whether if that's the first thing you're going to do where the stakes are that high and you don't like haven't trained that kind of mentality. Mm. Yeah. Good luck, man. That's not even even something like Volkanovski played rugby. I played rugby as a kid. Just having that mm. idea of going in and have getting getting to there first. If you hold back there, you're going to get hurt. So mm. gotta go forward, man. That was that was the mentality the whole time. Yeah, dude, dude. And uh, we spoke about this on the last podcast as well, but you took that you took a massive nut shot. Sure did. <laughs> 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 and then you got up in like a couple of minutes, you just I think you no, less than a minute and just kept going and all that. And then you told me that your coaches were just yelling out, nah, you're fine, you're, you're fine. fine. No, um well, one thing that we've done a really good job at, um and this is a big shout out to my conditioning coaches, head coach Oliver Bali, lecturer at ECU. Um, strength and conditioning coach, Matt Plush, um, lab tech at ECU. I've got some real good guys on my team that just help me out because they like like putting up with me. And um, the cardio has gotten fantastic. My trainings, I'm in great shape. And we knew that going into the fight and this one too. So the idea was push the pace. If you can hold that pace the entire time, even the commentators were saying, we don't know if we can hold this pace. I'm like, yeah, I can. I know I can. <laughs> but um, when I got kicked in the nuts, it gives him rest time if I take time off. Yeah. And the referee was telling me, you got five minutes, relax. And then my coach is saying, get up. And you know that sick feeling you get when you caught one in the nuts? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Here's a weird thing, though. When I ever got hit, when you get hit in the nuts, the best thing to actually do apparently is jump up and down with straight legs. Oh, yeah. Which really? sounds counterintuitive, but a guy told me that in BJJ, and I was like, fuck, this actually works. Jump up and down, eh? Yeah, if you jump up and down, de- oh, I'm not asking to get kicked in the nuts to demonstrate, but. <laughs> well, look, if I caught one in the nuts again on this fight and you see me jump up and down, you'll be like, yeah. <laughs> He's listening to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. I don't know the, the what is it, the anatom- the medical reason behind that, but yeah, apparently that works. Anyway, so uh, from there, you've had pretty much over a year worth of uh, wait time and all that. <sighs> have, man. And it's then been... you've had so much stuff fall apart from there because of COVID, people back now. I'm feeling much better about all that now because um, I think we've gone through the peak. Ever since the last time we spoke, we've had all of this stuff. I, I, I got it. 
I went through my isolation wait, and stuff. You, wait, you, wait, you actually got COVID? I did, yeah. That was only a f- few weeks after we last talked, I think. Um, really? Yep. Um, it did not affect me really at all. I just had the sniffles for a few days and then isolated, played a lot of video games. I got lucky. Eh? I think I was already in decent shape, so it didn't knock me down that much. Shit. What are you playing at the moment? Sorry? What are you playing? Red Dead 2. Red Dead 2. <laughs> my girlfriend's <laughs> back on that. She loves that. <laughs> yeah. So we ended up getting Elden Ring. A few months oh, back. Oh, Souls games, man. They they hurt me. No, I'm, I'm addicted to them. It's such a toxic relationship. <laughs> I know. Love I've seen all these memes of people breaking their controllers mm, and shit. Yep. <laughs> I mean, I never played Souls games at all. No. I, I never even bothered to. And then I kept seeing it everywhere, and my girlfriend got it because she loved those. She loves those kind of games. Oh, you got yourself a keeper, man. Good on you. Yeah, and then <laughs> she hated it in the end. Like, yeah? She absolutely hated it because it was... I, I'm not going to lie. It is difficult. I haven't played Elden, Elden Ring yet. But the reason why is because there's no clear instruction how to do everything. If this is a game where we didn't have the internet, we didn't have YouTube. You wouldn't know where to go. Exactly. And then that's what makes it so damn difficult. But I'm enjoying it now because I've got YouTube, you know, TikTok, watching heaps <laughs> of videos and how to get better at it quickly. Yeah. I'm not just wandering around. I'm going on the instruction. That makes the game so much more fun. And I yeah. reckon that's what makes the big difference. They definitely that. punish the hell out of you as well if you go to an area you're not supposed to be in. Oh. Because you just, get the, you just get mobbed by a bunch of dudes that are, like, way better. Yeah. Oh. People are probably asking, like, what the hell are we talking about? But I'll just clear this up. But, like, um, I lo- that it's funny when you, at the start of the game, when you do the tutorial, it's actually against you you, there's a boss that comes out and it's supposed to kill you and all that you can't beat it yeah and then the next thing everyone does is they open up the um into the open world which is brilliant by the way because i love how open it is and you can free so freely go everywhere but there's that tree sentinel right in front of you that just like pounds you and everyone i'm pretty sure everyone who played the game at least attempted that i've got a level of respect for someone that's beaten like any souls game like bloodborne dark souls whatever because like you're supposed to learn from your mistakes and you're going to make a lot of them. Like people say, oh, I don't like it. I keep dying. Yeah, that's the point. Like yeah. it's almost like an analogy for life in a way, like how resilient you are. Are you going to like learn from what you did to try to do it better? I had bosses on the Think Dark Souls 3 I died to at least 50 times. That's the point. You're supposed to, mm. you know, you get pissed off. You swear a little bit. You take some time off. You think what could have gone better? What do I do differently? And you adjust and you give it another go. And mm. I think that if you can apply that to other stuff you do, in a way, like, those games have helped me handle shit outside of life. <laughs> I never thought of that, yeah, really. I actually absolutely. think of that, that, that now. And then what I can say is, ladies, if your man keeps calm after playing Elden Ring or Dark Souls or Bloodborne, he's a keeper. He's a keeper. He's a keeper. And he's got some ambition about him, too, and that's what you need. He's not going to say, man, this game sucks. He's going to keep driving. <laughs> it's funny now that video games have become more relevant to life than ever and all that. They're just getting, like, I used to play, like, Mario. I feel like an old man saying this, but, like, I used to play, like, 8-bit Mario when I was, like, four years old. And Me now too. I go to Red Dead 2 and I'm like, this looks real. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, is that, like, your style of game, open world? Yeah. That, yeah, definitely when I was growing up and I was younger as well. Um, at least Assassin's Creed in those games was pretty into. I'm a sucker for fighting games as well. Um, love me some Tekken and all that. But, um, Do you ever like play those games and you just actually think to yourself, "That's not fucking legit," or "Is that legit?" You know, does that have a question yet? Absolutely, hundred percent. Yeah, <laughs> but you enjoy them for what they are, you know. Correct, correct. Yeah, because then you say have absolute. They have like they have uh, these videos where real martial artists and they break down the techniques. Try the moves. St- yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, how much is that? Is like. You know, how much of those people are actually, like, legit and all that? Or is it spite simulated or anything like that? Anyway, so coming into this fight, uh, do you – what – do you have, like, a game plan or anything on that or what we're going to do? Or? Not to give away too much stuff in case yeah, people, of people are listening, but um, make it exciting. That's the number one thing. Um, not to put myself at an unnecessary risk, but I'll be holding that center. I'll be there and – the fight will be as um, as back and forth as he wants to make it. That's always going to be my style because it's fun. It's enjoyable. It's not going to be a fencing match or a chess match or anything like that. That's not how I roll. Um, it's funny. My nerves going into the first fight wasn't I sure hope I don't win, I win or lose. The nerves was I hope that people like me. Really? Yeah, I don't know. Like at the end of the day, like the result, I'm, I'm in there to win. There's no question. Yeah. But just seeing everybody watch and have a good time and just enjoy it like and them cheering not necessarily cheering for me but just cheering because they're they're and having a good time 
I enjoy it, man. It's the entertainer of me. I have a good time doing that stuff. So if I can, if we can put on a good performance and like people feel like they got their money's worth, I'm a happy guy. It's going to be great. Solid. So do you, uh, do you have to do, much? I know we've talked about weight cutting earlier on this episode as well, but do you actually have to go through much of a weight cutting process? <laughs> Not much, man. Because um, you fight at featherweight. And I remember f- you tell me you don't like to stay too far away from your fighting weight. Nah, I got my coaches that keep me on, on board with that. Um, all of us published multiple studies on um, weight cutting for combat sports, how to keep yourself in that in that air in that margin, so that you have to dehydrate yourself as minimal as possible. I'll have like a couple kilos tops when it comes down to it, and awesome. that's like you know that's a big poop and a little bit of time in the sauna, okay. so I'll be fine. Um, the the payout the cost for that is all year round. You have to be on point. You have to track your meals. You don't have to starve yourself, but you do need to keep yourself within that that counter you can't let yourself blow out in the off season because that's also going to help your longevity if you're constantly going up and down and patty pemblet's a terrible example I don't know yeah that dude he i actually saw a photo of him what he looks like <laughs> today bad. before he came in i'm like man because he was at the um waiting some all that he yeah was somewhere like yeah. and there was a picture of him he's not going to last long physiologically like Losing weight quickly and gaining it again yeah. is yeah we call it the yo yo we, we call it yo yo diet. You were a nutritionist, yeah, 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 yeah. You've yeah. worked in that field, and um, you're as you're going to go as far as your metabolism lets you go, which, as you know, that declines with age, that declines with the punishment your body takes. So as that starts to get more and more difficult, if you keep those habits, you're you know, doing yourself harm, more harm. I can drink beer and eat macas when I'm forty. I don't need to do it now. Yeah. I can have I can have to stay sane. I don't restrict any food. If I want Maccas, I'm cut, I'm di- in camp now. I'll go have chicken McNuggets if I want to. You can do that? Yeah, of course I can. As long as I stay in the kilojoules and keep my protein up. Right? Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah. This is, yeah. <laughs> but, um, I'm, but that's the thing. When people say, let's go get Maccas, they think, oh, man, we're going to get like a big feed. No, just get a cheeseburger or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'll if actually, all of us listening to this, I'm not going to go get McDonald's after this. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but fair enough. So what's... um. What's your schedule like training wise then leading up to this? Do you have to periodize much or? So we do a um, monthly, a three weeks on one week off schedule. The one week off's a deload. So I still train, it's just a bit more chill. Mm -hmm. So the runs are a bit shorter. The sparring, the drilling is just a little less intense. Gives the body a bit time to recover, relax. I think that's going to be next week for me. Then I'll have three weeks of decent yakka. And then the five week's going to be like a deload because it's going to be relaxed. You need that time. I train, I remember we were talking about my training schedule last time. I said I train twice a day and then take one day off. And you said that's a lot. Yeah. And it is, yeah. but not where every day is hard, like hard training. Yeah. Sometimes I just rock up and just dick around, move around a bit and have some fun. I've, I've now like obviously thought about that. And it really when it comes down to how specific it is to the training. So say, for example, you know, obviously BJJ for context, you can train BJJ every day just depending on what you do inside that session. Absolutely. If you drill like five days, spar two days, you should be fine, mm-hmm. really. And then on top of that, training weights as well with it or flexibility, doing flexibility or going for more runs, it can. It just comes down to how hard as well you recover. Mm-hmm. Always tell, well, People always saying you've got to recover just as hard as you uh, train or if not harder. Does that, uh, like, so what is that something you, so what is uh, what you do for recovery? Do you ever, like, delve into, like, ice baths? Or? Yep. Um, and I know the research um, doesn't really support some of these things, but Correct. it really comes down to what makes you feel good. I love me an ice bath. Yeah. Like, it feels great. It's a topical anesthetic, so you kind of feel a little bit more relaxed on your nerves. Love me a sauna as well. That always just feel really relaxed afterwards. Regular stretching, I do yoga 10 minutes in the morning before I go to work and stuff just to limber up. Because always the worst part, one of the hardest parts about when you're training hard is the morning when you wake up afterwards and you just stiff as a board. You probably know the feeling as well. So just trying to minimize that, like, you know, the soreness and the the tiredness. Sleep's so important too. The moment that I fall off the track with sleeping, it all falls apart. Like you need to have that schedule completely locked in. Yeah, and not even that because on top of you doing two t- training sessions a day, you're also working full time. I do, yeah. Shout out to Orbit Fitness. That's um where I work with Jack. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, yeah, lovely job. They've been good to me as well. It's um good to work in a field I'm passionate about, which is you know health and fitness and stuff. 
Um, just depends where the customers go. They go to the boxing equipment. I'm just like, I'm your guy. Mm-hmm. But go to Pilates. I can't help you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you ever do Pilates? No, but I've heard it's really tough. It is. <laughs> yeah. Like, Pilates is no joke, guys. Like, I mean, I did it like once, maybe twice. I remember a girl I was dating at the time, like took me to one of those like centers and then they have like this piece of apparatus and it's got like cables and you push it and I'm like, it's all body weight, but it's isolation. Yeah. So that's why I wouldn't say it. But a, a lot of uh, BJJ guys and obviously MMA fighters I've been speaking to, a lot of them do yoga and they've actually really oh, life, getting... Life changer. Yeah. Yep. Is that is that something you do Just as well? Ten, 10 minutes in the morning. Um, got a YouTube channel, Yoga with Cassandra. So she's an American. She's got a million subscribers, so she probably might not hear this, but shout out. Nah, just 10 minutes in the morning, just like some basic stretches and just really helps you feel a little bit looser, ready to go about. Because I might do my conditioning in the morning, mm. like whether it's a run or a lift. So I wake up 7 o'clock and I'm like, oh, no. So just like because you're sore and you're not feeling it, just something to move around and help you get light, ready to go about the days feels nice. Awesome, awesome. So there's one other thing I forgot to ask you on the last podcast as well, but do you have a walkout song? I do. What's yeah. your walkout song? Uh, it's Boogie by Brockhampton. I don't know, if, but my walkout, I've had a lot of props about my last walkout. I had a really fun walkout. It what was, was it? Awesome. Hey? What was it, Lazo? I don't know. Just uh, the song you mean? Or? Yeah, the song. The song yeah. was Boogie by Brockhampton. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, well, I've, never, I've never heard of Oh, I'll song. play it afterwards. You'll okay. love it. It just sucks because on the YouTube video, my walkout's not on there. But that was yeah, the best, and that is that. That was the best part about my fight, to be honest. I had a damn fun one. The crowd, I had a really supportive crowd. A lot of people from my gym were there, so like, just feeding off the energy, having a damn good time. And I'm gonna have the same walkout the next time. That was one of the most enjoyable parts of the night. So that'll be pretty fun. Ah. You'll know. You'll know when I'm going in. Okay. <laughs> well, well, I'll be there and all that in the crowd and all that. So, that, but uh, what, what I was gonna say was like um. What was the atmosphere? What is the atmosphere for someone who's going into a fight like that? What's going through your head, like backstage, when you're walking out, compared to when you're in the cage? It's nerve-wracking, no doubt. And anybody that tells you that they're not scared before a fight is either lying, which is probably it, or they're just a straight psychopath. But 90% of the time, it's they're lying. Because everyone, you're about to fight a dude in a cage in front of like hundreds of people. If you're not feeling a little bit nervous, like, you know, it's there's something wrong with you. And I think that's what separates people that have like that are courageous and people who aren't is that you need to contain that and you need to learn to breathe and relax through it. Once you're out there, if you just fall back on your training and if you're confident you've trained well, you'll be fine. Mm. Like it's and it takes time. It's way easier said than done. It's easy for me to sit in a podcast studio and talk about how you just got to get in the zone. Mm. But with train with experience and that's why i mentioned earlier it's i feel it's very important if you do want to do something like mma where the consequences of losing are bigger you could get knocked out or hurt Mm -hmm. you should do a martial art or some kind of sport before where you get used to that feeling yes because you need to learn how to contain that and and everyone's different you need to be able to channel it in a way that feels great for you i did psych um for my bachelor's my undergrad and there's an arousal curve it's like a bell curve yes and if you go too far one way and too far the other way, it's not optimal. If you're not feeling it, you don't give a shit, you're apathetic, you get beat up. Mm-hmm. If you're too nervous, you suck yourself out and you get beat up. So you just got to find that little happy medium in the middle. Correct. And usually to get that little moment, like I've spoken about this many times before, and it doesn't just apply to fighting, but also in life, like the space between thought and action, that's the most scariest time. Mm. And then we talk about whenever you're about to go do an event, uh, your pre-performance anxiety spikes Mm. seconds before doing something. But every second, once the event has commenced, it drops dramatically. So that's why people need to tell themselves, you know, it's so, it's so natural. Mm. And you, but the main thing I've I've always asked, like how do you combat like something like that is you have to remind yourself, this is going to pass. This isn't forever. Okay. You're feeling it now. You're not going to feel it in 10 sec, like 20 seconds. It helps that, Um, One of the few people, but obviously I think we all get a kick out of it because we all do it, but I genuinely know I'm going to have fun when I'm in there. Okay. Even no matter what the consequences are, like I'm enjoying myself in there. I'm having a good time. I got kicked in the face last fight and smiled. Like it was fun. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. I don't want to go into why, but it is like, um, I remember looking, it was a GSP interview, George St. Pierre, who's one of the greatest ever to do it. And he said he hated fighting. He was terrified about fighting. Even in the cage, he wasn't having a good time because Mm. he liked the lifestyle that it gave him. That's why he did it. To me, that's impressive because you're not even having fun. (laughs) 
Mike Tyson also said the similar thing. Yeah. He said he used to cry used before to cry his before. fights. Seen that too. Which, and because he used to cry because he had to go hurt this person. He didn't really want to go hurt this person. Yeah. But it shows like there is a soft side to these people. And they do have empathy. And I think that's what makes them human and all that. Because mm-hmm. obviously, you know, um, one of the people, so, I mean, um, what's, the, what's the way to put it? Uh, I I've lost my train of thought, but what do you call someone who studies society? Sociology. So, that's that's cool. it. Or yes, um, anthropology. Fuck. Anthropologist. Yeah, anthropologist. Yeah, anthropologist. That's yeah. the word I was looking yeah. for. I'm trying to get one of those people on here to, to talk about yeah. whole fighting and why is it humans are so violent and why is that we love these kind of sports? You know, never been able to answer it. Hey. Yeah, I know. So uh, that's one of the people type of people I want to get in because obviously this is to do with health and fighting. Uh but yeah, like naturally, people even though we are. Um, Men for years and years have always been involved in violence, but we've always been empathetic to our opponents and all that. So the point is then I'm just trying to make is that it's very natural to feel what you're feeling. It's even I've spoken to grapplers. They're like, I don't want to hurt this guy. I just want to prove I'm better than him. Yeah. You know, and I have to do by all means. Mm-hmm. And then that's really all that it comes down to. And then when you go, even if you're facing who, regardless who it is, there's always going to be a level of empathy and respect for them. I remember having a chat with you last time about how like for years, especially in our culture as well, we've had it completely mixed up about what being violent means Mm. like, and what that term means as well. Just because you're capable of being violent, it does not make you a violent person. Mm. Matter of fact, if you don't know how to be violent, if it's needed, you're not peaceful. You're just harmless. Correct. Like you have no control over any situation that you have. I mean, being able to have that ability in you, but then controlling it and without sounding like a moral superhero from a Spider-Man movie, you know, being responsible with that power and directing it into um, helping people that are weak, building up people who need it, protecting people that need protecting. That's what it's all about. That's the confidence that it gives you to be able to do. But we're told from a young age that the moment you start roughhousing with your mates or like you wrestle in the playground or something, oh, he's bullying and beating him up, pull him apart, put him in the corner. That's how I grew up. And I think that it was a very, it wasn't a very constructive way to be raised. I think that we need to get exposed to these kind of like lessons from an early age. You see so many kids that are very angry and they have that pent up energy, but they don't know how to direct it. They're just told to not do that stuff. Yeah. I just wish there was a better argument for this than just saying things like when you talk about fighting on the playground, like, oh, it's just boys being boys. I'm like, no, I think there's a much more deeper reason to it than that. You know, that's what I believe. But another thing we also talked about, and this was also in reference to what, you know, you've been saying about being violent and all that, what it means is, you know, in reference to Jordan Peterson, where we said a harmless man is not a, is a harmless man is, a dangerous man is you not should, a harmless man. A yeah. dangerous man. You should fuck. be a monster and learn to control it. Yeah, that. Oh, ones. my God. No, you're fine. That's yeah. one of the ones that you should, yeah. I'm going to get this. So a, ha- a dangerous man is not a harm. A harmless man and shouldn't be a dangerous man. Should You should be a monster and then learn how to control it. But yeah. a harm, a ha- sorry, a harmless man is not a good man. A good man is a dangerous man who has it under voluntary control. You got, you got there in the end. <laughs> <laughs> you got there. In the end. Well, I needed that moment. <laughs> you got there. No, but I remember that's exactly. That's yeah, exactly. Correct. And then you, when you go out to Northridge and stuff, really, like it's usually the most quiet. I always say, always say it's the most quiet guy. He's the one who's the most composed when she hits the fan. It's always the loudest man in the room who's the one who's always like doesn't really know much when it comes to. Fighting. Oh, you would love. Oh, my team would love if I told the story on the podcast. But we had a um. A uh, very angry guy when we all went out to, I think, Magnet House or Northbridge. And, like, lovely place, so it's nothing against yeah. the establishment. No, but yeah. – um, and he was throwing his weight around a bit and he got all up in the face of um one of our – um. One of our purple belts who's like, oh. like <laughs> and, I, and I stepped in and broke it up. Yeah. Because – and, like – and – I remember like going back and I'm thinking like, I'm breaking this up to protect you. Mm -hmm. Like I couldn't understand the mentality of like, you don't, you have no idea who that other guy is. I could never understand starting a fight. Never been in a street fight my entire life. I I just, because you're exposed to that in the cage, you understand the implications of what happens in those situations. You know what can happen. And you know that there are people, you also learn to know that like the people that don't look it could, might be able to absolutely mess you up. True, true. I've had some very nerdy looking guys in the gym that absolutely would destroy me. 100%. <laughs> See, here's the other thing. It's not a reference to you, but like 
guys who are small as well and professional fighters or amateur, even amateur fighters who have been training for a long, long time, they don't even look like, I mean, from an average, like Joe's perspective, they wouldn't know, oh, that's a fighter and all mm. that. Yeah. So I remember, I'm not going to say any names, but I remember there was a time in Northbridge where I met up with a guy who I knew after work and then we were in a club at one point and he was a bantamweight. Yeah. And some six foot something dude, uh, I know Eshe or whatever the fuck was Aha, like, giving yeah. him a bit of trouble. Uh. But he was ready to go, man. He was composed, but he was on Defcon night and he kept talking about his height, calling him small, calling him little, like, fuck you up. And I'm just like, this dude's like signing his word uh. just right there. But it's the idea of the image when it comes to fighting means almost nothing anymore. That's the other thing. So I, I compete, I compete open weight tournaments all the time. Yeah. And because of my wrestling background, I tend to do pretty decent i think i've i've won second in the open weights a few times and i'm always 10 20 kilos behind and i do find like it's and the thing is about size is like it doesn't give you a free pass on the technique it allows you to do techniques better so there's no question you get two people that have the exact same technical level bigger guy's probably going to win no question but being big doesn't give you a free pass and that's a hard lesson to learn when you're a big guy i've seen plenty of big guys go to the gym Mm -hmm. and they have a hard time on people that are like 20, 30 kilos lighter. It's not a free pass. Correct. And being bigger never gives you that. I guess some that wouldn't know because, you know, my giant five foot seven stature of what it's like to be a big guy, but I can imagine <laughs> that you don't really get tested too much because people get one look at you and they say rather not. Mm. It doesn't happen when you're little. <laughs> like, yeah, especially so when you play like contact sports, like yeah. you, you have to learn to deal with it. Otherwise you shy away. And Fair point, fair point. So, unfortunately, sorry, man, that's all the time we're coming up to. Come to uh, we've got Always for today. Anyway. Always goes quick with you, man. Ju yeah, Julian, I just want to say thank you very much, brother. Absolutely. Appreciate it. If anyone can follow you, where can they find you? Julian underscore G underscore 157 on Instagram. Uh, Eternal Tickets, the code is my last name. I'm not even going to bother saying it. Just copy and paste it on the bio. <laughs> It'd be great to see you there because um, we get a little bit of a commission as a code. So, show some love. I'll buy you a beer if, I can, if you can prove you've done it. And, um... Yeah, I'm really looking forward to the end of this month. Awesome, man. All the best with your fight. Good luck, brother. Cheers. Thank you very much for coming on. Thank you very much, guys. That's the last set podcast, and that is game.